My name's Andrew Phillips and I'm the Executive Director of the Virtual Radio Network. And I'm pleased to bring you a radio feature I produced some years ago for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. This program's called The Unheeded Message of the Holocaust. And it's a fascinating and disturbing story of a very brave and decent man's attempts to bring news of the Nazi Holocaust to the Allies in the early 1940s. And how the Allies, specifically the British and Americans, did nothing. At a time when some questioned the veracity of the Jewish Holocaust, when ignorance and cruelty smash people's lives in Europe once again, and in other places in our world, when governments shirk their responsibility to act with courage and dignity in former Yugoslavia, and in Eastern Europe and Russia, signs of fascism emerge once again, we need to listen to the pure decency and courage of Jan Karski. But before I tell you more, permit me to explain how I learned of this man. It was about ten years ago that I saw French filmmaker Claude Landsman's nine-hour monumental documentary called Shoah. Shoah in Hebrew means Holocaust. There's a riveting scene in that film when Jan Karski's interviewed by Landsman, the first time Jan Karski had agreed to speak publicly since the war. Jan Karski's testimony in Shoah described firsthand the suffering of the Jews, how Karski had been smuggled into the Warsaw ghettos and the Belsic concentration camp, and how, as an official courier for the Polish government in exile, which was first located in Paris and later in London, how Karski brought word of the Holocaust to the Allies, and it was a startling story. Well, a day after viewing the film, I was travelling on a train to New York from Washington, where I'd been working on a story. I was leafing through the Washington Post, and to my amazement, found my eyes glued to a small headline in the letters section. Holocaust, it said, the leaders knew. And it was signed Jan Karski from Washington. He was the man I'd seen in Claude Landsman's film just the night before, Jan Karski, writing a letter to the Washington Post. Well, as soon as I arrived in New York, I called information. And once again, to my surprise, they gave me Jan Karski's telephone number. And that's how I got to interview him in his home in the suburbs of Washington, one cold February. In fact, it was Valentine's Day. I remember because the tall, aristocratic Karski held a red heart-shaped chocolate box in his hand when he answered the door. We went to his basement where his wife taught dance. She'd survived the death camps, but never, never spoke about it, Karski told me, as we sat together in the dimly lit room to begin our interview. There were four ghettos. Initially, in the Warsaw Ghetto, there were some 450,000 Jews. But in June, July, August 1942, great deportation started. As we learned later, by that time, final solution was already decided and they were to be shifted from the ghetto to the east to the concentration camps, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Sobibor and other camps. Now, at the time I entered the ghetto, there were no more than 45, 50,000 Jews left. In May 1942, Polish underground diplomatic courier Jan Karski met secretly with two Jewish underground leaders. They offered to take him to the Jewish ghettos. They were desperate. Already Jews were being transported to death camps in their tens of thousands every day. The Jews of Europe were being exterminated. The three men met in German-occupied Poland in a Warsaw suburb, a desolate ruin of a house at twilight with just a single candle burning. The Jews demanded their story be exposed to the world. Jan Karski would be their messenger. 
They didn't give me their names, you understand, only their functions. The Jewish underground leaders represented two distinct factions within the Jewish political community, the Zionists and the Bundists, who were socialists. A little jokingly said, well, uh, we told uh, both of us we don't see each other eye to eye, but we now decided to meet you together. This is a Jewish problem. He volunteered to take me to the ghetto. And then he told me, we told, this was my pseudonym, I know the English. When you will tell them what is happening to the Jews, they may not believe you. We told, would you like to see it? There is no such a great danger. And to give you sense of security that we would not endanger you for nothing, I will be your guide. Will you go? He said, I will go. And then he was my guide. I visited twice the ghetto. The house I entered into one of those four ghettos, the outside front of the house faced the regular street. Only the back of the house through the basement, you entered one of those four ghettos. Of course, I heard about it, but now what I saw, it was, was horrible. Oh my God. Children, uh, women, old men, everybody having something to sell. An onion, a piece of bread, a piece of cloth. Begging, I am hungry, hungry, please, please. All the some Jewish men. Well, I remember him standing, immovable. Huh? So I uh, said to my guide, he's standing, is he dead? He says, oh, no, 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 we told, he's dying. He's not dead yet. Uh, in the streets, uh, naked bodies, dead. So I again whispered to him, what is this? He says, well, you see, when a Jew dies, the Jews have to pay tax to have him buried, but uh, they have no money for tax. So they uh, put uh, men, woman, child in the street. But then it doesn't work, uh, be told. Then uh, people who pass, if he has shoes, if he has any clothes, so they take it out. A dead man does not need any clothes. So I saw completely naked, some skeletons lying in the street, stench, horrible, it was in inhuman. And uh, he just guides me, follow me, follow me. And only from time to time I remember he was whispering. He told, remember, remember, remember. Two days later, Jan Karski made a second visit to the ghetto to memorize more vividly the impressions he'd take to the outside world. This time I was prepared emotionally, you understand, to this completely different reality. It was not the world. The man says, you will see something. Now you will see something. And then Jews uh, leaving the streets. So I didn't understand what is happening. Uh, follow me. He enters the first house, bumps at the door. We are Jews, we are Jews. Open the door. Somebody opened the door. A woman was. I remember her. We go to the window and we observe. And then I saw a horrible thing. Two boys. Hitler Jugend. Nice boys, clean, they walking, some joking, etc. Just one, sometime back, etc. Walking. They walk empty streets. And then one of them, they whisper something to each other, then one of them, out of blue, you know, gun, handgun, handgun. And he shot. 
And then, silence, and then, ah, the glass broken. He just hit somebody, and he just killed him. He put the gun, and they walked out. Nothing happened. I couldn't take it. That woman, I remember, I think that she suspected, uh, because I didn't look a, a Jew, you know. Because she approached me and says, Go, go. It doesn't do you any good. Go. And we left. It doesn't do you any good. Don't yet opposite la pana. Yeah, pan It was horrible world. As well as the ghetto, Jan Karski witnessed a Nazi concentration camp at Belsek in eastern Poland. Five weeks later, he'd set out to give his report to the Allies. In November 1942, guided by the Polish underground, he crossed Nazi-dominated Europe. He travelled overland disguised as a French worker, first by train to Paris, and then south, trekking across the Pyrenees into Spain to Madrid, then Gibraltar to London. My trip from Warsaw to London, I remember it very well because it was a sort of a record. It was my fourth mission, lasted 21 days. Now, I had a problem. I spoke French fluently, but of course everybody can recognize that I'm not a Frenchman. My accent is even worse than English accent. So we saw the situation that the dentist made injections into my mouth. So my mouth became swollen for several days. So I couldn't speak distinctly. And I traveled to Paris with Frenchmen and they couldn't gather that I was not a Frenchman. I was very well treated. I reached Paris and it was uh, just the beginning of November 1942. Now, in Paris, the situation is different. No Frenchman likes it, you know, when I tell them. Life was normal. I was quite normal. Nightclubs, I know Paris very well. I, well uh, before the war, I went to Paris uh, many times. All nightclubs were open. Everybody absolutely engaged in black market. Which struck me, because then when I reached London, nobody in London, no men, would deal in black market. It was not uh, fair. Huh? <laughs> He's an Englishman. So now, first with the British, the individuals to whom I remember specifically, I passed the information, four members of the British War Cabinet. Churchill, of course, as Prime Minister, was chairman. So I reported to Eden, representative of the Conservative Party, Lord Cranborn, representative of the Labour Party, uh, two, one Greenwood and one Dalton, who was the secretary, Chamber of Commerce, which uh, he kept in his hands all economic matters, all trade, war trade, weapons, etc., powerful men. So I reported to those four men. Then I reported to Lord Selborne, who was supervisor of all European underground movements. And then rather more minor figures, Mrs. Wilkinson, MP, and other people. So this was England. 